So this video is looking at the approaches on paper two of the AQA A-level psychology syllabus. Now this is just a quick overview of the approaches. It's not every single bit of information about it, but really useful for your revision and to refresh your memory if it was a long time ago that you did the approaches. So we'll start off with the origins of psychology. The first piece of research on psychology has been credited to Wilhelm Wundt in 1879 in Germany, and this is the first psychological lab experiment or study that has been done. Now he was looking at introspection, which is breaking down conscious awareness into basic structures of thoughts, images and sensations. And by breaking these down into their constituent or separate parts, this is called structuralism. So it's a really positive thing for psychology that this was done, as it paved the way for future research and experiments to be conducted. This is where psychology started, it gives us our foundations. However, the process of introspection is incredibly subjective. It is up to your own personal opinions on how to interpret these thoughts, images and sensations. So it has some biases in it. It does not give us reasons for behaviours either. It just gives us separate parts and structures. So there's a lot that could be improved from this. And overall, it's not a very scientific method. The emergence of psychology as a science came about because of introspection and because of the issue that it is so subjective, it was being highly criticised by a lot of people, including behaviourists such as John Watson. So Watson decided we needed to bring in the experimental methods of natural sciences, such as the biology, chemistry and physics. And that changed the way psychologists performed any research and it led to psychologists developing a variety of different approaches to explaining behaviour. So we're going to start to have a look at the approaches, run through the assumptions and some quick evaluations too. So the first approach that we are going to look at is the psychodynamic approach. And this was first brought about in the early 1900s by Sigmund Freud. Now it has three main assumptions to it. The first one is the unconscious mind. And according to the psychodynamic approach, we are only aware of a very small part of our mind called the conscious. But most of our mind and behaviour is controlled by the unconscious, which we are unaware of and unable to control. But this unconscious mind controls a lot of our personality and a lot of our behaviours. It can be studied through psychoanalysis, which includes things like Freudian slips, and it includes things like hypnosis, free association and dream analysis. But it's very difficult to do. We can't access it very easily, so we have to use this psychoanalysis to try and help us access this area. The second assumption is the tripartite personality. Tripartite personality includes three parts to our personality. The first one is the id, and that is the pleasure principle. It is present at birth and it wants you to get what it wants. The second one is the ego, and that contains the reality principle. The job of the ego is to balance the id and the superego, and that develops around the age of two. But the ego also employs defence mechanisms, such as sublimation, repression, it's to try and protect itself a little bit. And then you've got the superego, which is the morality principle. This wants to do the right thing, it always wants to follow the rules, so sort of like the angel. And that develops towards the end of the phallic stage. The last assumption of the psychodynamic approach is the stages of psychosexual development. Now Freud believed that every child goes through these stages and they are the oral, the anal, phallic, latent and genital stages. The phallic stages contains Oedipus and Electra complex. For boys it's the Oedipus complex having a strong sexual desire for their mother and for girls it's the Electra complex having a strong sexual desire for their father. Now Freud researched this through the case study of little hands. Little Hans communicating with his father through letters and looking through his phobias and his fantasies to provide evidence for the stage of psychosexual development. So if we look over to evaluation of the psychodynamic approach, first of all our negatives, it is not very scientific, it is very subjective, it's very different for each individual and there are no empirical methods so no experiments, no direct observation is being used. It's also psychic determinist, as it states that all our behaviour is pre-decided by, by our unconscious, so we have no free will over our behaviour. But there are some positives. It is quite useful. I mentioned psychoanalysis previously. That is a positive to help us look at the unconscious and repress thoughts, although it's not used as widely as it used to. Also, it is rich in detail. The case study of Little Hans was very detailed into his thoughts and his experiences. However, because that's a case study, it's not very replicable and we can't replicate this with other individuals.
The second approach that we are going to look at is the behaviourist approach, and this has got two main assumptions. The first assumption is called classical conditioning, and this is where behaviours are learnt through association. And this was studied by Pavlov. Now, in Pavlov's study of dogs, we were looking at the unconditioned stimulus, which is dog food, gaining the unconditioned response of salivation. There was also a neutral stimulus, so the neutral stimulus in Pavlov's study of the dogs was the bell, gaining the response of no specific response from the dog. Then, for the conditioned stimulus, this unconditioned and neutral stimulus must be associated together after numerous times of conducting them at the same time. So for Pavlov's dogs, the conditioned stimulus quickly became the ringing of the bell, and the conditioned response was the salivation, because an association has been made by the dogs between the food and the bell causing them to respond with the salivation. Now, obviously, this was done with dogs, but we wouldn't know if we could apply that to humans without the study of Watson and Rayner. And that was on Little Albert. Little Albert gained a conditioned phobia of anything that was white or fluffy due to Watson and Rayner making a large noise behind his head every time he reached for the white wrath. He associated those two things together and generalised the phobia to everything that was white and fluffy, not just white rats, and this was rather long lasting. So we can link that to human beings too. The second assumption is operant conditioning, and this is where behaviour is maintained through reinforcement. We can see this through Skinner's study of rats. We need to remember our key terms such as positive reinforcement, which is gaining a pleasant consequence or a pleasant reward for doing a behaviour that is desired. That will increase the likelihood of you performing that behaviour again. For example, if you behave well all week in school, you get a certificate. You're more likely to behave all week again so that you can try and gain a reward of a certificate. We've also got negative reinforcement. And negative reinforcement is performing a behaviour to avoid a consequence or avoid something negative. And again, it increases the likelihood of you doing that again. So you may bring your homework into lesson on time to avoid a detention. You're more likely to bring it in on time again to make sure that you don't get a detention. And then we have got a punishment or a consequence. And this, this is to try and reduce that behaviour happening. So if you did get a telling off from your parents for a certain behaviour, then you're less likely to perform that behaviour again. And this was mainly researched by Skinner and his rat study. So let's have a look at the evaluation then. The evaluation we've got many options for. We look at our negatives first. It is reductionist, so it oversimplifies behaviour to association and reinforcement. It doesn't take into consideration genetics or previous experiences. There's also a lot of animal studies used in the behaviourist approach, and that reduces our generalisability to humans. However, we do have the study of little Albert. And the majority of the studies that are conducted by the behaviourist approach are lab experiments. So it could be said that they are too controlled, meaning that it's difficult to generalise it to a real life setting and may lack ecological validity. However, there are a lot of positives too. Research into the behaviourist approach can be useful. If you think about the study of Little Albert, that has allowed us to see that we can condition phobias into individuals. But it also means we know we can decondition them as well. And it led to the development of treatments for phobias such as flooding and systematic desensitisation that will increase the the quality of life of the individuals. Scientific methods were also used in research for the behaviourist approach. Empirical methods of direct observation and experimentation are used. There's a lot of standardised procedures which increases the replicability, also meaning we can research and falsify the studies a little bit more. And because it is usually done in lab experiments, there are high levels of control, especially over extraneous variables, and that allows for a direct cause and effect to be seen. So there are many strengths and weaknesses for the behaviourist approach. The next approach that we are going to look at is the humanist approach. The humanist approach is very different from any other approaches that we've looked at. I know more that we'll be looking at in a couple of minutes time. The humanist approach is ideographic and ideographic means it looks at the individuals rather than looking at a group of people. And the humanist approach does not want to be scientific. It believes that everyone's unique and everyone is subjective. So it's looking at the individual on their own rather than looking at a group of people. Now it has three main assumptions. The first assumption is free will. Now free will assumption believes that humans have full control over their behaviour, so it's not pre-decided by anything else. 
but the only limits on that are any societal rules and laws that we may have to follow. It also believes in holism in this assumption, so we have to look at an individual's entire life, not just one part of it, to try and understand their behaviour. The second assumption is Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and this hierarchy of needs has five stages physiological, safety, love and belonging, esteem, and self actualization. Each of these levels must be complete before achieving self actualization, and that is what humans are striving towards. And then the third assumption is the conditions of worth. This came from Rogers, uh, and we have a current self, which is how we see ourselves now, an ideal self, which is what we want to be, and then looking at how closely those match is called congruence. The more congruent we are, the more mentally healthy an individual is, according to Rogers and conditions of worth. But the further away our current self and our ideal self is, the more incongruent or mentally unhealthy a person is. And this may come from the different conditional positive regards. Conditional positive regard is when someone places conditions upon their love. So I will only love you if you achieve 100% in all of your exams. Or unconditional positive regard is where there's no conditions placed on, on love. I'll love you no matter what. And both of those can be both positive for some individuals, but negative for others. We also look at person-centred therapy, which is where the therapist places the um, focus upon getting this congruence level increased and trying to change a person's perception of themselves, focusing on the unconditional positive regard. So the evaluation of the humanist approach, if we're looking at our negatives, it's not scientific. It doesn't want to be, but that's still a negative because it's very subjective. There are no empirical methods. We can't replicate it because we won't get the same with every individual. It also has a cultural bias, especially with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, only applies to individualistic cultures. In a collectivist culture, these individuals prefer to work together and not focus on their individual achievements meaning that they probably cannot reach or will find it more difficult to reach self-actualisation, meaning that the approach has a full cultural bias. But there are positives. It is useful because the person-centred therapy is trying to improve congruence levels of an individual, which is trying to make someone more mentally healthy and increase their quality of life. It's also not determinist, so it's saying that none of our behaviour is pre-decided, and we have full free will over our behaviour, meaning that we can take responsibility for our actions. Our only constrictions on that are the laws. Another approach that we need to look at is called the social learning theory. And again, this has three main assumptions. This is a branch off of the behaviourist approach and is coming under learning theories generally because they agree that we gain our behaviour through our experiences, but just not through association. They believe it's through things like modelling and identification. So the three main assumptions, the first one is behaviour is gained through modelling, identification, imitation. So they believe that behaviour is learned through observation of role models, especially those who we identify with. Now that is usually someone who is of the same sex or gender as us, or someone who is of a similar age, a celebrity we may identify with or a family member and we imitate that behaviour and that's where our behaviour comes from. This can be seen in Bandora's first experiment with the Bobo dolls where one group of children saw an aggressive model towards the Bobo doll, another group of children saw someone who ignored the Bobo doll and then we had a control group as well. They were all put in the same conditions after that so they went through aggression arousal so they were took into a second room allowed to play with some perfect toys but then told that they couldn't play with these because they were reserved for the best children and moved into the third room and this is where the children were observed. Now those who observed a adult that was aggressive were increasingly more and significantly more aggressive towards the Bobo doll than those who didn't see someone who was aggressive who played nicely. So it shows that we do observe and imitate behaviour quite dramatically. The second assumption is vicarious reinforcement, and this is seeing another individual be reinforced for behaviour. And again, this can be seen in another study by Bandora, which saw some people be aggressive towards a Bobo doll, or some children be aggressive towards a Bobo doll, and be rewarded with sweets and a drink for a champion performance. Another group saw a child be aggressive towards the Bobo doll and be shouted at for it. And a third group saw a child be aggressive towards the Bobo doll, but have no reinforcement. 
And those who saw a child be told off for being aggressive were the least aggressive overall towards a Bobo doll whilst being observed. So that shows that we learn through seeing someone else be told off or rewarded for their behaviours. The third factor is mediational factors, and that includes attention, so you must pay attention to a behaviour, retention, so you must be able to remember exactly how to do the behaviour, motor reproduction, so you must have the physical ability to be able to perform that behaviour, and motivation, you must have the drive and the desire to want to replicate it before you do. So those are our three assumptions of social learning theory. As for the evaluation of the social learning theory, again, we'll look at our weaknesses first. And the social learning theory can be classed as reductionist as it explains behaviour through imitation of others, which is oversimplified. We really should be considering other factors such as genetics, associations and emotions, as well as this imitation and observation of others. This may reduce the validity of the social learning theory overall. We also have that there is an over-reliance upon lab studies, the majority of Bandura's studies all in a highly controlled setting, but this could mean that demand characteristics could come into play, or it's difficult to generalise these findings to real life settings. However, we do have some positives. Because of Bandura's findings that children will imitate aggression from adults, there is a limited amount of aggression and violent acts allowed to be seen on television before nine o'clock. This is trying to protect children, those who are the most impressionable and vulnerable to this type of imitation, from committing aggressive acts that they have seen or imitating them from the media. We also have positives of it being lab studies. Lab studies give a lot of control over extraneous variables, so this allows a direct cause and effect to be seen, meaning that there is higher internal validity overall. But there are obviously strengths and weaknesses of the lab studies being conducted. We are now onto the cognitive approach, and the cognitive approach uses inferences, and this is the process whereby cognitive psychologists draw conclusions about the way mental processes, for example your thoughts, operate on the basis of observed behaviour. Now this is because things such as your thoughts cannot be seen even in a brain scan, so we have to make an educated assumption based upon the observed behaviours we can physically see. Now there are three main assumptions to the cognitive approach. The first one is that we are like an information processor, in that we pay attention to the world around us and we perceive small qualities of an item, search our memory and then apply language to it. For example, you may pay attention to a room and perceive an object to have four legs, a cushion and a tall back on it. You will search your memory for something that has those qualities and then apply language, so calling that a chair. The second assumption is that of schema. And schema are packages of beliefs based upon previous experiences. Now these could be quite positive. These may help you to know how to behave in a new scenario that you've not been in before, but they could also be negative. You might have the last time you sat an exam felt quite panicked and nervous about it, and the second time you sit an exam, even though you've done as much revision and preparation as you possibly can, that schema may make you feel panicky again and reduce your ability to gain a high grade. So they can also have negative qualities too. The last assumption is the mind is like a computer and the computers and human minds are similar in terms that they have memory, they both input information into them and output information as in humans will speak and the computer will output by opening a program. So we have the input, humans from their senses, a computer maybe from their keyboard. We process that those information from our senses and search things like our memory to know how to behave and think about what type of behaviours we should do. And as a human, our physical output is the behaviour or the words that we say. Very similar to a computer whose input may be from the keyboard or the mouse, they process that and their output may be typing or opening an application. But humans will do this in a different way for their behaviours. Now we'll look at the evaluation of the cognitive approach Negatives first again, it is reductionist because it explains behaviour being due to the information processing and computer analogy, which is oversimplified. It doesn't consider that humans have got emotions that may change their output, whereas computers do not. So it makes it a reduced explanation, it makes it lower in validity. And again, we have the over-reliance on lab studies. With the cognitive approach, when researching things like memory, researching things like attention, it is a lab study that is done 
and this may reduce the ability to generalise it to real life settings, reducing the ecological validity overall. However, there are some strengths too. It is quite useful, it's allowed for the development of cognitive neuroscience, which is where psychology is today. The use of lab studies also allows us the direct cause and effect relationship to be seen, so allowing these inferences to be made quite accurately. And it's also quite scientific as empirical methods are used, so direct observation is used rather than second-hand data. The last big approach that we're going to look at is the biological approach, and that includes four main assumptions, making it the biggest approach that we do in psychology in this part of the paper. The first assumption is that behaviour has a genetic basis. This includes looking at twin studies. We have our monozygotic twins, which show 100% of their DNA, and dizygotic twins, which show 50% of their DNA. When we look at twin studies, we look at concordance rates, and concordance just means the extent to which twins share the same trait. If we were looking at a certain behaviour or a certain disorder, if the concordance rate for monozygotic twins is higher than the concordance rate for dizygotic twins, we can say that that disorder or behaviour has got a genetic basis. However, if the concordance rate for the monozygotic twins is less than 100%, we also have to acknowledge that there is at least some influence of the environment. This assumption also includes genotype and phenotype. Genotype is the genetics that you inherit from your parents, and the phenotype is the interaction of those genetics with the environment, giving us our physical characteristic that we can see. The second assumption of the biological approach is evolution, and this is, includes natural selection, which is genetically determined variations that make someone more likely to survive are passed on. If you think about a giraffe, previously their, gen their necks may not have been quite as long, and a random genetic mutation allowed their necks to grow a little bit longer, allowing some giraffes to reach higher trees to gain more food. This meant that those giraffes were more likely to survive and that trait has been passed on for many generations. The third assumption of the biological approach is neurochemistry, and this includes neurotransmitters such as dopamine and serotonin, and hormones such as testosterone and adrenaline, both acting as messengers to allow different messages to travel around the body, but in two different ways. We also have neuroanatomy, and this includes the frontal lobe, parietal lobe, temporal and the occipital lobe as the main lobes that control our behaviours. We also have our left hemisphere and our right hemisphere, and we have our localised function, including Broca's area, Wernicke's area, that we will look at in more detail during the biopsychology part of the course. If we look at the evaluation of the biological approach, there are a lot of strengths and weaknesses overall. Looking at the weaknesses first, again this is reductionist, it explains behaviour through genetics and neuroanatomy, which means it's oversimplifying behaviour. It may classify a disorder such as depression as being completely genetic and fail to consider any previous trauma that individual may have experienced, reducing the validity of the explanation of behaviours. Again we have an over-reliance on lab studies, it may be difficult to generalise any experiments results to a real life setting. And it is also highly determinist, biologically determinist. It says that all behaviour is predecided by our genetics, which we can physically not change, and that may, may take the responsibility away from an individual. But we do have some strengths. It is useful for us in knowing that neurochemistry has improved treatments for mental health disorders. We know that serotonin is linked to disorders such as depression, and that's allowed us to develop SSRIs to try and improve the quality of life for those individuals. The lab studies again give us control over the extraneous variables, which allow us to see the direct cause and effect. And the biological approach is highly scientific. The methods that are used are highly replicable, and they're highly falsifiable as well. We use things like brain scans, so there's no bias coming into play. They are highly objective studies. So having looked at the main approaches across time through psychology and how it's developed since Wilhelm Wundt in 1879, we need to look at where we are now, and currently we are with cognitive neuroscience, which is a combination of the cognitive approach and the biological. And this is the use of brain scans, such as fMRIs and PET scans, that are vastly improving our knowledge of what areas of the brain are linked to what function. And it allows us to develop things like training, which can improve certain types of memory, 
or it may provide us more targeted treatments for different mental health disorders such as OCD, targeting the orbitofrontal cortex. So there are a lot of developments currently in psychology, mainly using these brain scans and allowing us to see which areas of the brain are activated during certain activities. The last thing we need to look at on the approaches is compare and contrast. Now when we're comparing and contrasting, you can be asked to compare any of the approaches and you must be able to give similarities and differences between any two approaches that you are asked for and give it evidence from each. The main tips that you can be given on how to answer this is first of all start off with a paragraph on a point. So the first sentence needs to say what the similarity or the difference is between two approaches. So it may say one difference between the psychodynamic approach and the biological approach is that the psychodynamic is not scientific whereas the biological approach is scientific. You then need to give some evidence or an explanation from assumption number one. So if you are comparing the psychodynamic that is not scientific and the biological which is, you here need to say why the psychodynamic is not scientific. If it's a similarity, you just need to say how both of these approaches are similar in terms of whether they are reductionist or they are both useful. And it's very, very similar for the next sentence after that. You need to explain it from the second approach. So using our example of the psychodynamic and the biological, you would now say how the biological is scientific. Lastly, we have a comment. Why does it matter that they are different? Is one better than the other? Why is that important? Is it better to be scientific or is it not? If it's a similarity, does it matter if they are similar? Does that make it a strength of them both or does it make it a weakness of them both? Just make sure you are prepared to compare any approach. You could get asked to compare any combination and you need to be able to do this in an essay as well as just an individual paragraph. Thank you for listening to our video today. Make sure you also look through your class notes. This is just a quick revision and overview. You need to make sure that you know a lot of detail on each approach. So make sure you use your class notes that you've been given to enhance your revision further.